well, you, you should be an industrial designer. And I said, what is an industrial designer? And he told yeah. me it's like a product designer. And it was seriously the most precious gift anyone had ever given me up until that point in my life. It mm -hmm. was the name for the thing that I was supposed to do. Yeah. And I didn't know what it was until that moment. And it was amazing. That's Dana Ramler. And this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast. Hey guys, I'm your host, Kara Duffy, and this is the Powerful Ladies Podcast, where I invite my favorite humans, the awesome, the up to something, and the extraordinary to come and share their story. I hope that you'll be left entertained, inspired, and moved to take action towards living your most powerful life. Dana is a product and experience designer. She's a wife, a traveler, a dreamer, a doer, a list maker, and an artist. She's returned to Vancouver Island, Canada after four years living and working in Barcelona. On this episode, we talk about how to make all of your dreams come true, why dreaming audaciously is highly recommended, and why the magic movie moments in your life can be of your creation. All that and so much more coming up, but first. Hello, beautiful listeners. Welcome back to the Powerful Ladies Podcast. We're so glad to have you here. Do you know the number one thing that you can do to keep this podcast going and to help us get more kudos out in the world and to have more people know about us? Go right now to your favorite place to listen to podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, tune in. I mean, holy smokes, there's a million right now, but I need you to subscribe and I need you to rate us and I need you to leave a comment about how much you love it. Even if you just want to talk about how much you love me or hashtag engineer Jordan, that works too but it'll mean so much to us to share how you feel about it and to love us by subscribing, liking, and rating. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for coming on the Powerful Ladies podcast. Thanks for having me. Of course. And you came by way of huge, glowing, like hyperactive recommendation from Adeline. I right. asked her who inspired her, and she's like, you need to meet my Canadian Oprah. And I'm like, ooh, yes, I do. <laughs> That's a very, um, very kind and generous thing of her to say. I hope, uh, I deal with it like imposter syndrome a lot, so I have no idea if I will actually live up to that, but I will try. I think you're going to do great. I think I think that's actually a big thing, right? The imposter syndrome. I know that I face it all the time where I'm like, I'm a total fraud. What am I doing? And every day. Yeah. Every day. Mm -hmm. Me too. And it's wild because if I sit back and take stock of like what I'm actually doing and what is tangible things that are created, I'm like, oh no, like I am allowed to have this on my resume. Like it's legit. And yeah. it's wild. It is. And if you think... I always look at other people and think, assume that they have it all together and that they don't suffer from imposter syndrome, but almost everybody actually does. So yeah, it's just a nice thing to remind myself sometimes like, oh yeah, everybody feels this way. Nobody has any idea what they're doing, but everybody mm -hmm. looks externally as if they've got it all figured out. Well, and I think also we, it's either like you're on that scale of you actually know more than you gave yourself credit or... Maybe you're on the scale where you're still like, oh, we're kind of like faking it till we make it right now. Um, yeah. But I think most of us who actually feel that way, we're not giving ourselves enough credit. No, probably not no. nearly enough credit. Well, let's go back and let's um, introduce yourself to the audience, who you are okay. and what you're up to. Oh, well, I, uh, my name is Dana. And I'm in Canada right now. I'm a Canadian. I was living abroad for the last four years where I worked with Adeline, who you've spoken to. Um, mm -hmm. That's where we met. And I just, well, not just, but it feels like just moved <laughs> home to Vancouver Island where I grew up. But it was actually a year ago, right around this time last year, that there was a huge shift happening. And I still feel like I'm just settling into my, my new life mm -hmm. here, though it has been a year. So that's, that's something. Um, I'm a designer of objects and experiences. I get, I was thinking about this question a lot because mm -hmm. there's what I do that I get paid for. And then there are all the things that I do that are just as important to me that I don't get paid for. So I consider those part of what I'm up to, but me too. I get paid to design objects. Um, but I'm also a designer of experiences and 
um, an aspiring writer. I, this is one area where I definitely have imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, and I am a dreamer, a maker of objects. Um, I wear many hats. I think all the most interesting people do. So I think most people who are interesting and awesome and up to something and really out to create their best life, most often are doing a hundred different things. Like, I, I don't, it just, it just starts and all of a sudden you start designing and then you're like, oh, what else can I design? And, oh, I want to do that. And especially if you're coming from a creative mindset, like it, for me, I know like it doesn't stop. Like it's horrifying sometimes the list on my wall of ideas for companies or brands or we need this or how fun would that be? Yes. Yes. That. <laughs> that. <laughs> yeah. It's overwhelming. Um, and that's what makes it horrifying to me is that it's overwhelming. But I actually see all of these things like existing. Yeah. Th they're going to be there at some point. It's just a matter of when. Yes. That is how I feel. And I'm, I'm an Achiever. I don't know if you've ever done your like strength finders. Yes. Achiever is my top strength. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a very type A goal oriented person. I love achieving things and, and creating goals and getting there. And I'm never, ever satisfied with how long that takes. Yes. And I am never satisfied with how much I'm doing. I feel like I'm constantly um, judging my own productivity and I'm always reminding myself of like, there's no there's no finish line. There's no arriving. Like the, this is the process. This is the whole thing. Just doing these things and exploring is the point. Yes, but I, I, I imagine that our strength finder would be almost identical based on what you've shared so far. <laughs> yeah. And for me, I'm always like I'm so project driven mm -hmm. that I love checking things off the to do list and then having it done and being like, "Cool, what's next?" Yeah. And I know like I have to build that into powerful ladies itself where I like look at all of it as projects, like one month is a project, one episode is a project. Um, and even creating phases, because if I do the same thing every day, every week, I'll lose my mind. Like I can't yeah. handle it. Um, in fact, I try and delegate anything like that to somebody else because it's the fastest way for me to be disinterested in something. Yes. Um and I forget that not everyone operates this way. Like I mentioned bef before we were starting about Jordan thinking I was completely insane for mm -hmm. recording five episodes in a weekend. And to me, that was not insane at all. I was like, no, we can do this every day. She's like, you're yeah. out of your mind. I just had an interaction with my husband this morning where I realized like, oh, I'm a challenging person in, <laughs> in, in that, like, I, you know, my favorite way of approaching a situation is like, why not? Why can't we? Right. Why couldn't we? What's stopping us? And not everyone operates that way. And I have to be mindful of how I challenge things or people or situations so that it doesn't yes. come across as like a steamroller because not everyone is like me. And mm -hmm. I'm just trying to appreciate that. Yes. Jesse, my boyfriend, reminds me regularly that not everything happens on Kara time or Kara pace. Ah, uh, yeah. That's, mm. I could take that and yeah. address that for myself. That's yeah. a good reminder. I always ask, well, why not? But yeah. I accept it <laughs> eventually. <laughs> um, so you met Adeline when you were in Barcelona area? Is that where yes. you were abroad? How long were you yeah. there? I was there for four years, so I'm almost to the month, actually, four years. It was an amazing experience. And actually, thinking about that experience in the context of what we're just talking about in terms of pace and activity, it was a great experience for mm -hmm. me to learn to slow down. Yeah. Um, nothing happens quickly in Spain, in especially with government or administrative tasks, like things. I am, I am still waiting for my 2014 tax return. What? Yeah. So I may never get that money, but I, <laughs> whatever happens next, I might haunt Ernst and Young Spain. I'm not sure, mm -hmm. um, but I'm still waiting for that. So for someone who doesn't have a lot of patience or didn't have a lot of patience, there were so many aspects of living in Spain that were probably exactly what I needed for learning those lessons and slowing down. And mm -hmm. I... I lived in Vancouver for a long time and it's a very active, uh, I would find perhaps it was the the circle that I was running in, but I found that like 
the people that I was interacting with at work, my friends, all very active people in terms of what they're up to, um, being physically healthy. Mm -hmm. So every weekend, you know, you check in with people on Monday. What did you do this weekend? Oh, I went for a hike. We went to Ikea. We did this project at home. We did this and this and this and this and this. That's how I operated for a really long time too. Yeah. And then I remember, I don't know, a couple months into my job in Spain and one of my colleagues asked me about my weekend and it was something similar. And he looked at me with this look of like, not admiration. And it was disgust. And I was like, <laughs> what are you doing? Mm-hmm. You're we-. And he said to me something that is so pivotal in my life. He's like, weekends are for rest. You need to rest. And I thought, huh, that's a novel idea. Let's rest. <laughs> How do you do that? How do you do that? And mm-hmm. it took me four years, but I actually started to adapt that. I still, mm-hmm. I, I struggled with, you know, I, I didn't want rest to become like laziness because there's something mm-hmm. there. I didn't want to just be like idly spending time meaninglessly. Um, though I do know part of the creative process and part of being a creative person means having time where you're not doing something so that your brain can mm-hmm. digest all the things you're absorbing in your life and turn that into something. Um, So at first I was a bit resistant, but after four years, I started coming to value it and really taking it on. And I started noticing that um, nobody I knew there was busy. You know, when you ask your friends, like, how are you? And like, "Ah, so busy. I never heard that there ever in four years. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was really relevatory like what is going on with where the culture of where I'm from Mm -hmm. and that's something so I'm on a total tangent now but like that was a huge lesson that I got from there that just in the context of how we kicked things off it's so pertinent I had a similar experience living in Germany I was there also four years almost to the month and interesting right I'm sure this is going to keep happening on this entire conversation for everyone listening like we've never talked before we've had a few email exchanges and that's it so I know almost nothing I've done a little bit of research but nothing really Mm -hmm. um but I love the fact that everything was closed on Sundays and it closed at 5 p.m on Saturday Because for the first time ever in my life, it forced me to have a whole day of rest on Sundays. Now, that didn't mean I I was like Netflix and chilling all day because I just can't do that. Um, But it did mean that I was like spending like no urgency social time with people or Mm -hmm. like just being outside with no agenda and just taking a moment to make to check in. And I miss it. Like I try really hard having, I've been back in the U S now about seven years and Mm -hmm. I still try really hard not to do any errands on Sunday. And in fact, recording this podcast has been one of the first things I've scheduled in a very long time that's happening on a Sunday. Um, kind of cause we have to, and that's okay. Um, so I just take that day and another day of the week right now, but it's, it's, um, something I think that, I always made it a U.S. thing, but it's probably a... Mm-hmm. But when we look at things that any family of any identity values, it's time together. It's time to take care of each other. It's time to take care of not just kids, but elderly. It's um, the ability to like take a day to go see a kid's school event or to take care of them and just have a life. And I don't, it makes me so mad when we're talking about family values and I'm like none of that is a family value that you're trying to argue about right now. It doesn't actually help any families have a better family life. So obviously I get very it, heated. Amen. About, right? <laughs> oh, yes. It, it, all of that. Yes. I, I think you touched on a lot of really important things and I was, I was noticing that as well. Like what's the difference between my life here in Spain and mm-hmm. what was going on in North America and why is that happening? And I did notice, I mean, I'm sure maybe, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I guess like your experience in Germany was also challenging at times. For sure. Yeah. So Spain was also like an incredibly challenging time. And there's a lot of things, you know, language barrier aside, just culturally things happen very differently. And Mm -hmm. there were times where that was a wonderful and delightful surprise. And there were times where it was really frustrating. And I came to realize that like the source of what I loved and was really challenged by in Spain was coming from the same place. Like mm-hmm. that, that 
relaxation and time spent together with families is like what created a non-hustle environment, which was what was frustrating for me when I wanted to get some banking done or when I Mm -hmm. couldn't believe it would take three weeks to get your power turned back on after a clerical error. Like, how could that be? Um, But the source of it was from this like place, I believe, a place of not being in a hurry. And and I was sharing this with some friends when I moved back and and they ask like, well, don't, I guess they just don't have anything to, you know, they don't have the same demands on their schedules. And I, I thought that that can't be true. You know, mm-hmm. they have friends, they have hobbies, they've got family. Everybody that I knew who was Spanish was spending an entire day with their families. You know, I mm-hmm. might spend every third weekend or fourth weekend with my family. So they had even more demands in mm-hmm. terms of their free time with family. They just, they found a way to fit it into their lives. And then they just didn't talk about being busy, which was so refreshing. I almost feel like in North America, there's an elevate, uh, an element of competition about it, you know, like yes. you're busy as a badge of honor and it means you're a productive person. Mm-hmm. And um, that's something that, you know, someone asked me, what, what would you say and said if you're not busy? And I said, my life is full. Mm-hmm. And that shift reminds me and shows me that I have a choice on how my, I fill my time. Yep. We all have the same 24 hours. So if my life is feeling really full, then I need to address what I'm filling it with. I think that's a great point because the power of choice and choosing the life you have, whether you think you've made it yourself or not, mm-hmm. changes all of it. Like it can be such an overwhelming and scary mind shift because once you take responsibility you realize that it's yours to own Mm -hmm. which could also mean that it's yours to fix or change or do whatever you need to do to it Mm -hmm. but you can't until you take responsibility for every element of you of your life that you love or that you hate or that you want to evolve you can't do anything about it because if it's not yours you're blaming somebody else Mm -hmm. it's a great excuse to get you off the hook Mm -hmm. but it's also the biggest barrier that we face in living the life that we want to live like it's it's and people think it's not possible and to me that's the gap between thinking it's possible and feeling that it's not the people who don't think it's possible don't realize how much that you're not even how much you're in charge that you are a hundred percent in charge of what is happening in your life yeah you're the source yes i always remind myself that like life is happening for me Mm -hmm. and because of me not to me That's a great point to make. Yeah. I mean, everything that I, it's funny because I think I often, um, I ask things of the universe. I Mm -hmm. think that's a theme I've heard on this podcast from the few episodes I've listened to. (laughs) And it's really interesting because I've like, I've always gotten what I've asked for. Mm -hmm. I'm learning now to be specific in what I ask for. Yes. Because I, I will declare things like, I want to have, I want to experience things that no one else has ever experienced. And then like a really terrible, challenging, awful thing will happen. Mm -hmm. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. That's actually what I, you know, that's the interpretation the universe made. I should have said joyful things, you know, or I have to be really specific because everything I speak aloud Mm -hmm. comes into fruition eventually. Uh, Yes. This keeps happening, happening to me, especially as I've been leaning in on a full entrepreneurial and freelance journey. It's almost like the universe hears you and it's like the genie from Aladdin that is like, oh, really? That's what you want to ask for? Okay. You sure? Because I'm going to have fun with this. Are you sure that's what you want? Like it's very entertaining for the universe to like watch us have to figure it out after we ask for something. It must be. It must be. I, I declared when, when you're like, I want to be masterful at communication. And I meant interpersonal communication in like the workplace and in my relationships. And then I got a job in Spain where I couldn't speak the language <laughs> to anyone. And I was like, not what I meant in the universe. Not what I meant. Someone's got jokes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Which, there, you know, that's if we can if we can acknowledge that it just brings an element of lightness to it all and yeah. it shows us that we're part of like I kind of view it as like a game and mm-hmm. it's more fun that way you know if we got yeah. exactly what we asked for it might be a bit boring yes there's no art without a bit of suffering no and that's I mean or it'd be really boring and life in general yeah yeah so prior to you 
getting to Reebok? Like, can you give us a, a rundown of where, like, you grew up in Vancouver Island, and then what? How did you go from there to Spain? Oh, good question. Um, well, I actually was born in the center of Canada, in Saskatchewan, in the prairies, and I moved to the West Coast when I was a kid with my family, mm -hmm. which I'm very fortunate for all the time. Um, because I grew up on like the most beautiful coastline of the world, I think. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate it. it formed a part of my identity and appreciation for nature. And the opportunities I had exposure to were vastly different than what I would have had had I grown up in, in the prairie. So that was a pivotal life moment, I think, without mm -hmm. realizing it at the time. Um, and then, I mean, I'll try to not go on too many tangents, but I think they're kind of relevant because it's, when you ask people about how they got there, I wish I had heard more stories mm -hmm. like mine of unconventional pathways. So if, Please if do. it's okay, I'll share. Yes. So I always wanted to be an artist, I thought. I didn't really know, um, you know, in what capacity, but I just had this desire to create. And I had a conversation, I think, with a teacher and I said, I wanted to be an artist. And he said, yeah, me too. But look, now I teach grade 10 math. What a and he jerk. just seemed in, like a really, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I looked up to the adults in my life mm -hmm. and it wasn't just him, but there, you know, my parents too, like I want to be an artist. And there was some hesitation to support me because of the viewpoint that they had in life mm -hmm. and what they knew to be possible. And they loved me and they didn't want me to suffer. And they hadn't heard too many stories of artists who weren't suffering so they didn't mm -hmm. necessarily discourage it but they weren't exactly super encouraging either there was mm -hmm. more some hesitation there and there was a lot of suggestions like why don't you be an art teacher and at that time when I was approaching graduation of high school there were there was this whole thing that like all the teachers were going to be retiring so there's going to be a teacher shortage so it seemed like a really logical career move so I went into to, I went to university to become a teacher. Mm -hmm. And in my um, second year, I had what I think was a nervous breakdown, um, probably a nervous breakdown, because I was on a path. I realized I was on a path to a life I didn't want. I didn't want to teach mm -hmm. art to people. I wanted to make things. And how did your breakdown manifest? Oh, my gosh. I remember it so vividly. I was home for the weekend. I lived in at the university in the residence there in a dorm and I came home and I was working on a project and I was, I just like remember I was trying to, I was drawing something because it was for my art education class. So mm -hmm. I was learning, I was doing art projects as if I was in high school or elementary school for learning how to teach those. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, this is not what I'm supposed to be doing. And I don't know, I think like a pencil broke or something and something inside me snapped when that pencil broke and mm -hmm. I just lost it. And it was just the most sorrowful tears coming out of me and sobs. And my mom kind of looked at me like, what is wrong? Yeah. And, um, and, you know, like, I think I also needed a good cry. Yeah. I need those every now and then. And, uh, I started looking at something inside me stirred a little bit. And I started looking at this, um, weekend or no, it was like a, a three week art intensive course or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm going to sign up for that. Like, it's not going to count towards my degree because it's not through this university. It was from a local art college. It's not mm -hmm. going to count towards my degree, but it will count towards my profession. Mm -hmm. Oh, I remember part of the breakdown was that I wasn't learning. I felt like I wasn't learning the skills that I felt I needed to teach art. Like I was doing art projects, not learning about color theory or how to do things. Mm -hmm. So I felt like a failure already and I hadn't even started. And so I thought, I need more knowledge. So I'm going to go to this art um, course, a three-week summer art course. And at the end of it, um, we had to do like a little, we, ha we had this opportunity to show our work to the, I don't know, the dean of the school for feedback. And he looked at my stuff and he was like, congratulations, you've been accepted for our fall semester. I'm like, oh, no, I, I didn't apply. Like, I'm not, <laughs> I'm just here for the summer. And he was like, well, that seems a bit foolish, don't you? Because this is clearly a path you're supposed to be on. And I was like, huh, there's something about that. And then wouldn't you know it, 
I went home that day to find the letter in the mail saying you've been accepted to the teaching program at the University of Victoria. Congratulations. And I held these two opportunities in my hands on the same day, which would become a theme for my life many times over. Mm -hmm. And I called my mom and I told her, like, I think I'm I think I'm going to go to this art school. And she thought, I, she said, I thought you might. Um, OK, that sounds like a great idea. And I think having that breakdown, um, maybe shifted something in her perception of it all too. And she saw how important it was because then she was on board in a new way, which made me feel really supported. Mm -hmm. So I went there and um, in the fall and I had a year and this uh, drawing teacher of mine gave us assignments that were pretty vague, you know, like draw a collection of objects or mm -hmm. I can't remember what they were, but I kept drawing objects. Yeah. And he said to me once, um, he looked at them and he's like, why do you keep drawing these spoons and forks and <laughs> vessels and bowls? And I was like, I don't know, I'm just attracted to these objects. And he's like, well, you, you should be an industrial designer. And I said, what is an industrial designer? And he told yeah. me it's like a product designer. And it was seriously the most precious gift anyone had ever given me up until that point in my life. It mm -hmm. was the name for the thing that I was supposed to do. Yeah. And I didn't know what it was until that moment. And it was amazing. And if I look back on my life, like, the way I played with Barbies, I was building furniture for them. I mm -hmm. was using old things and making, like it wasn't the dolls. I was building them worlds and yeah. and a waterbed made out of an old milk bag or like a Capri Sun juice uh -huh. container. Um, so it was like funny to look back on it all. Like, of course, this is what I'm supposed to do. I'm supposed to design yeah. objects and make objects for humans. And uh, so then the school that I was at did not have a program to support that. So I used my first year at that school as a way to build a portfolio to apply to the, the university that did have the program that I wanted. So mm -hmm. when I finally entered Emily Carr, which is a school here on the West Coast of Canada, um, I was already considered a mature student because I was a few years <laughs> into the game. But it was actually really wonderful as well because I had an appreciation like mm -hmm. uh, for what it was that I was up to. I, you know, it wasn't, just slacking off, rolling through the motions of university. I, I was really in it because I knew exactly what I wanted out yeah. of it. And um, yeah, that was a really like convoluted, meandering path to where I was supposed to be. But I'm really glad I ended up there eventually. And I, I think it's, uh, you know, to me, talking about industrial design is important because I don't think enough people know it exists and how everything that we touch as unimportant as it may seem like right now I'm staring at a Purell bottle mm -hmm. somebody had to design that like somebody yeah. spent probably a year trying to figure out how or to right or more to make this bottle hit the price point not look hideous like try and make it the best thing it can be for what it's going to be and function like there's all this engineering and design work that went into it and no one ever acknowledges it because we don't know we don't talk enough about how things actually get made. Yeah. I'm glad There's we're starting few, to more, but. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's a few categories within industrial design that are really sexy that get all the attention, like mm -hmm. electronics. You know, I right. think a lot of students in my school thought they were going to design the next iPhone or wanted to. Mm -hmm. I was never interested in those things. In fact, I was continually drawn toward fabric. Mm -hmm. And I'd taken sewing lessons in high school. I wasn't an overly popular person, so that um, might have been linked. Um, but I took sewing lessons on Wednesday nights for the whole five years with a bunch of menopausal ladies who complained about, like, how hot they were constantly. And mm -hmm. I was always cold because the windows were always open. And um, I learned how to sew. And I kept – anytime I had a chance to make a project in university out of fabric, I would take it, partly because I was interested in sewing and partly because – um, it's interesting how people impact our path. Mm -hmm. There was this like really grumpy dude who ran the workshop, the wood, the wood workshop. And mm -hmm. I just couldn't stand him. He was, he spoke to me like I was an idiot. He wasn't very kind to women in general. And I mm -hmm. just wanted nothing to do with that space. And there was always a lineup to use any of the tools. And I hated being at school when it was dark. I wanted to be in a cozy, warm space at home. So yeah. I just started making things out of fabric and I found myself in this world that's like a subcategory of product design, soft product design. Mm -hmm. And um, while I was in my fourth year there, one of the career advisors asked me, you know, why don't you apply for this internship or co-op program uh, opportunity at Lululemon? I'm like, what? Why would I do that? Don't they just make black stretchy pants? <laughs> no. There's also like bags and um, soft product there. I'm like, oh, well, that sounds actually 
something I'd be interested in. So mm-hmm. I applied for a job. I applied for that co-op and I ended up getting it. And I think I spent like one or two days a week for my fourth year learning about the industry. And then by the time I graduated, I was offered a full-time job there. So mm-hmm. that was, I was very fortunate. One of very few people that I graduated with to have a job right away because we also graduated during a bit of a recession. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't an easy time to be exiting art school and entering the real world. Yeah. I'm really, really grateful for that opportunity. And I I think it speaks a little bit to the fact that you were in the place you were supposed to be. You were really focused. You were, you weren't at university to get the university experience. You were there to get these critical skills for what Mm -hmm. you knew you needed on your path next. And I feel that when you get to a point in life where it's you're hyper focused and the momentum keeps going and you just keep saying yes, mm-hmm. like kind of like we talked earlier about how the universe has a sense of humor. Mm-hmm. I agree with the big magic book from Elizabeth Gilbert that it wants to play, like it wants to interact, like it wants you to play along. Mm-hmm. And like every time a bell rings, an angel gets its wings is what it says in the movie. And I always think that every time someone says, I can't, that the universe dies a little bit. Like, it's sad. Like, yeah. it's it's heartbroken because it's like, what do you mean you can't? Like, no, like we were playing and you were doing great. And so I feel like every time that someone says yes or okay, or even just uh, I'll see for now, and it moves the ball a little bit forward, um, that's when all the golden nuggets and other reinforcements start to show up because- If you're open and saying yes, like not that shitty things don't happen, but there's something about you playing along and following what you're meant to do that changes how the whole world shows up to you. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. And I also would add to that, that I, I don't think we can get what we don't ask for. No, the the universe can't read our minds, you Mm -hmm. know? So when I, um, whenever I've wanted something, I ask for it. I mean, we've touched on that, but Mm -hmm. I think you have to ask for what you want because, and sometimes the things I ask for are audacious. They They should be. Those are the best ones. (laughs) And I, and like, you know, I'm going to move to Spain and I'm going to have a company relocate me there. And my friends were like, yeah, right. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you what, that happened. And I want to work on a yacht and get paid to travel around the world that happened because I asked for it, you know, like we can't get what we don't ask for. So ask for audacious things, Mm -hmm. you know, and be specific if we've learned anything. Right. If you, yes. Mm -hmm. So (laughs) obviously everyone listening now wants to know what happened on the yacht. Like, what is that story? That's a little bit of a, um, uh, detour because I did, oh, so I got into the program at Emily Carr and Mm -hmm. then because I was a mature student, I was also feeling this like pull all those kids who had gone on a gap year traveling, like I had been really focused and studious for a long time and I was feeling the pull for an adventure. And I didn't feel like, I mean, I was a student, I was on student loans. I couldn't go on an adventure if I was paying for it. Right. It would last <laughs> very long. So, um, and I had, I had spent the summers, I love being on the water. I grew up on a boat with my, like not living on a boat, but we always had a boat. And mm-hmm. days after school, I'd go fishing with my dad or our weekends, we'd go putting around the shoreline. So I was really connected to being on the water and mm-hmm. love the life of boats. And while I was at university, before I went to Emily Carr, when I was at the University of Victoria, I had a summer job cleaning sailboats and I loved it. I got to just like splash around with my bare feet, Mm -hmm. no customer service, really listening to music, detail things, like cleaning things with like Q-tips, which is oddly satisfying for me. People might think that's insane, but. No, no, I am the same type of person. There's no, there's something so rewarding that putting something back to Mm -hmm. its um, original best condition. Yes. And then there's a moment where you like you do all this hard work. You get so to me, it's a it's a movie meditation as well. Yeah, you get yes. fully sucked into it, and then you step back and you're like, oh, "Look what I did! It's done! Yeah. It's beautiful again!" And I do that like three times a day, and I <laughs> loved it. <laughs> I loved it. I had great bosses, and mm-hmm. they they were um, they were aware of my goals to travel and stuff. And one of my one of the two, there's a team of two, and one of them came up to me one time and said, you know, we love you, and we would love if you came back next summer, but I got to tell you, there are fancier toilets on fancier boats <laughs> that you could be scrubbing, <laughs> and you get to travel the world, and I was like, go on, and uh-huh. you're like, well, 
you know, all these yachts that the rich and famous travel around on, they all leave from Fort Lauderdale in the spring and then they go to Europe for the summer. And I was already hooked. Like right. I didn't need to know anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, and he sort of told me what he knew about it. Like you, you got to get to Fort Lauderdale. You got to go now, like April, May. That's when they start leaving. Mm-hmm. They've been in the Caribbean all, uh, all winter. Now they're headed to Europe. So you got to get to Fort Lauderdale. And um, there's a couple of agencies that you could register with who will help you find a job. And um, I think I, he introduced me to someone he knew and I had coffee with them and I asked them some questions. And like one of the tips was like, don't take hard luggage. You'll look like a noob if you have hard <laughs> luggage. I'm like, All right. So I bought a duffel bag and I <laughs> packed it with, in hindsight, the most ridiculous things that mm-hmm. were not useful at all. And I thought, I'm going to go and do this for four months. I have four months off before school starts again. And I bought a ticket to Fort Lauderdale. And I thought if the worst thing that happens is I have to come home on this ticket mm-hmm. and I just live with my parents for the summer and I get a whatever job, but best case scenario, this works and I get to go traveling for the summer. So I went down to Fort Lauderdale and I found out there's like hostels for people like what I was doing. Cru- mm-hmm. cru- there's hostels sort of thing. They call them crew houses. And I found one of those and I booked it and I arrived and, I met with the people who were sharing like four to a house, I think. And it was a duplex with so eight of us. And I was like, hey, where are you guys? Where, where, which agencies did you register with? What do I need to know? And one of the people that I was working with said, well, I'm going down to a boat tomorrow that I know needs people. You should come with me in the morning. I have a car. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was like literally the biggest boat in Fort Lauderdale at the time. So I essentially like walked up to the biggest boat in the city <laughs> and knocked on the hall. I was like, can I have a job? And they said, yeah, we need day workers. Come on up. We pay 12 bucks an hour and uh, this is your task for the day. And I did that for like two weeks on that boat. They had a lot of work. They were getting ready to go to Europe and so mm-hmm. they were prepping. And they, I found out they had a position for a housekeeper. And so one day, um, because I'm a keener and I like to do a really good job, mm-hmm. and I like to get I believe in going the extra mile. Yeah. One day they asked like, oh, we have a really crappy job. Someone needs to clean the engine room. Now, it was summer in Fort Lauderdale. Right. Hot, and I was going to go into the engine room, which was even hotter. I was like, I'll do it. Like, hand up, raised high. I'll clean the engine room. And I spent all day in there, like, sweating, just soaked through with sweat. It's like and a big room class. Yes. And, but you're, like, cleaning, <laughs> cleaning engine grease. And I remember mm-hmm. the, the engineer was like, you know, this room needs to look like the queen could come here and eat off of any surface. I'm like, this is where the engine is. But okay, that's what you need. Mm-hmm. And everything was going super well until I cut my foot on something and bled all over the engine room. Oh, no. And fortunately for me, the chief engineer was like, oh, come over here. I got a first aid kit. And, um, you know, you're pretty. I noticed you're working pretty hard down here. My wife's the chief stewardess, and she's looking for a housekeeper. You know, would you be interested? And I was like, yes, I would be. And, you know, long story short, the in three days, I think I had that job. And they said, we need we can hire you, but on one condition, you need to do this course called your STCW 95, where you need to learn about like sea survival and first aid and stuff. So I did that. And then I think 10 days later, I was leaving for, no, I think it was like five days later, I was mm-hmm. leaving Fort Lauderdale for Venice. And I'm like, mom, um, I'm going to be on the ocean for like two to three weeks without the ability to, to call you or anything. And I'll, I'll let you know when I get to Venice. And I think that must have just been the scariest thing for her to hear. <laughs> You're yeah. doing what? But yeah, so I crossed the Atlantic Ocean and ended up um, really enjoying my experience so much so that I asked for a deferral for a year on my acceptance to the pro- program that I had applied for. Mm-hmm. And I spent a year working on a couple of different boats and saving money and also having really amazing experiences and days off in a different country mm-hmm. every weekend and and then I went traveling for a little bit at the end of all of that. So I came back to school, like truly refreshed and ready to go. So it was a bit of a detour, but nonetheless, it's an example of like, I want this. And then it happened. Well, now I'm inspired to be like, maybe I need to abandon all of this and work on a boat. <laughs> I will say it sounds glamorous. Um, I don't know if I could do it at this age anymore. Mm-hmm. It was it was, it was a bit of a lonely experience in terms of like, I wasn't with like-minded yeah. people. Um, I found like when we got to a new city, I wanted to go to an art gallery and everyone else wanted to go to the pub. Yeah. And so I would go to the art gallery by myself a lot. Mm-hmm. I shared a room, so I never had any like privacy or quiet time to myself. Mm-hmm. I, I had to do ridiculous tasks like iron pillowcases 
and socks, which I didn't realize needed ironing. I think the most ridiculous task I ever had to do was make the miniature bed of a standard poodle oh. who had like a bed that was shrunk, like a, uh-huh. just like all the guests, but his was shrunken to his size. And there was like sod or fake grass on either side of the boat. There was two of those poodles and they each had their own little platform on which to do their business every day. Mm-hmm. I had to feed them Evian, I, Evian oh. water, though I drank tap water. <laughs> If I can confess something, I feel like it's been long enough. That dog actually only ever had one bottle of Evian, and then I filled it with tap water all summer long. <laughs> <laughs> that was my stance. Like, I, uh-huh. I just, you know, this seems ridiculous. I don't think so, Simba, I think his name was. Well, and then he also <laughs> needed ice cubes because it was hot, so those were to be made out of Evian as well, which oh. was ridiculous. He got tap water without anyone really realizing it, and he was fine. Most dogs are fine. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If it's good enough for humans, I think it should be good enough for the dogs. I think so. I think so. And in in the event that there would be some horrible situation that would happen because he was drinking tap water, I'm pretty sure that that guest had enough money to pay for yeah. the whatever was needed. I heard a story from a colleague who said that a boat she worked on, the owner was really attached to his dog and mm-hmm. had it cryogenically frozen. Doesn't surprise me. No. A lot of things don't surprise me anymore after that experience. Mm -mm. No. And, you know, I keep coming back to, like, what it takes to live the life you want, right? Mm -hmm. Like, when when you make those declarations to the universe and you ask for things, sometimes they show up in ways you weren't expecting them to. Mm -hmm. Like, you did not say, I want to travel the world and feed dog dogs evian ice cubes like that was not your request but when things show up and it gives you everything you asked for but there's like this weird thing attached to it Mm -hmm. you just kind of go with the flow like you're not asking for a hundred percent perfect checklist this is the only way i'm doing it it's no here's an opportunity this is what it looks like there's some things you probably don't want to do but it gives you that same result would you do it anyway Mm -hmm. and i feel like there are moments i've seen lately um, and it might be more social media driven where people aren't saying yes to these little opportunities that will allow them to get to the bigger yes that they're looking for because mm-hmm. it doesn't, I don't know, they'll either say like it doesn't feel right or it's missing this. Like there's all these reasons and excuses why to say no to something. Yeah. And it's not about the opportunity looking glamorous and romantic and beautiful and perfect. It's it's still there. Like it's going to be what you create it to be um, regardless of how it kind of shows up. Yeah. Yeah. I think I love that you said that because I have been noticing connected to that. There's a lot of desire amongst people I talk to, to want to know like that this is going to work out. Like right. I'll do it, but I need it to work. Whether or not like they're approaching it with partners too for like, Oh yeah, we I could get married, but I need to know it's going to work out. Like, Mm -hmm. does anyone who gets divorced think that that's going to happen the day they say yes? I don't think so. You know, like there's no, there are no guarantees. So I always say, why not? Because there are no guarantees. Like who knows what could come out of this? Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. Well, one of my favorite quotes is you must be willing to let go of the life you had planned to have the Mm -hmm. life that is waiting for you. Mm -hmm. And, And it always has spoken to me because we create these ideal lives in our heads and they are amazing, right? We created them. They're perfect. We've thought about it. We think about them over long periods of time sometimes. But the truth is that if you're willing to play the game, there's actually something so much bigger and amazing that you've never thought of that's through that door. And, you know, when it it literally, life can literally show up as if there's a bunch of doors and you have to choose. And I remember for a long time getting like panic stricken about which door to choose, Mm -hmm. which is like a first world problem, right? Of like having the fact that that there was choices for me to make. I feel really lucky from that perspective, but I would still get overwhelmed about like which door to choose. And I just got over that one day because I'm like, does it really matter? Like the truth is, Whichever do- door I choose, I'm going to make an amazing experience. And if I go left right now to make a right later to get back to where I wanted to go, like, okay. Like, I can always get back to something else if I need to. Just like, you know, when I went to Europe and I'm like, well, I don't know if it's going to work, but I'm certainly going to try. 
what's the worst case scenario? I like you said, move back home. All right. Well, yeah. that's not yeah. that bad. <laughs> I love that you mentioned Elizabeth Gilbert earlier because she's a personal hero of mine, especially on in terms of what she talks about in regards to creative living. Mm-hmm. I went, I attended um, an event of hers this year. I guess it was February or March um, at Wanderlust Oahu. Okay, and she opened the session by talking about like her definition of creative living, and I have it written right here because it's so important. She says that her definition of creative living, and I'm paraphrasing here, but it's not about like being someone who paints or draws or writes or dances. Creative living is making decisions based on your curiosity mm-hmm. rather than your fear. And that's something that I'm all, I've been very passionate about for a very long time mm-hmm. is making, making decisions, taking action based on curiosity rather than fear or a sense of deficiency or Lacking. not enough. Mm-hmm. Yeah and making sure that there's curiosity. And I find that that opens so many new possibilities and it's even helped, it's even served me in terms of conversations with people or difficult relationships. Like if I approach from a place of curiosity rather than fear, yes, everything shifts and yeah, there's that. And then the other thing I wanted to add, if I may, to what you were saying is, um, I feel like there's an expectation. We do all this work to to create our vision and we do mm-hmm. all this work to achieve it and or to to actualize it. And there's this expectation that we're going to feel fulfilled mm-hmm. entirely yeah. in one moment. And what I'm realizing is that we can have it all, mm-hmm. but maybe not all at the same time. Yes, And I'll, I can expand on that a little. Like when I lived in Barcelona, I had the lifestyle that I wanted mm-hmm. in terms of living in a thriving city and I had a really cool job and I got to travel a lot, but I didn't have access to nature and tranquility the way that I do now here in the woods where I live on Vancouver Island in the forest where I can see eagles outside my window right now. And I was really missing that when mm-hmm. I was there. And now that I'm here, I have that and my heart feels full in that regard. Mm-hmm. But then I'm missing other things about life in Barcelona or that lifestyle. Yeah. And I'm just like stepping back to appreciate that collectively mm-hmm. I've had my whole like heart's desire in terms of experiences. Mm-hmm. And it's just if I shift it to realize that I don't necessarily have those things all in the same exact moment, then there's less resentment. There's less lack of satisfaction, I guess, Mm -hmm. dissatisfaction. Um, And there's just more appreciation for what is and then what could be because this moment is not, nothing's permanent. So whatever's lacking right now, I might get to fill up in the future, but maybe something else will be lacking. And just this constant state of flux and learning to be comfortable with that creates a lot more content in my life than I used to have. I think that's huge. um, There's so many things that came up for you as you were sharing that. Because I think in addition to us putting a lot of pressure on an individual moment, we put a lot of pressure on individual people. Yes. Right? Like, um, you know, whether it's who we're in a relationship with romantically, that they're going to, like, check all these boxes off. And you're like, hold on. Yeah. There's no, like, no one in your life checks off every box of human interaction that fulfills you. Like, it is not possible. Just like, um, you know, even for myself, like, I know that I can never deliver on all these things that, Mm -hmm. like, Jesse needs to live his best life because some of them I don't care about because I just don't care, right? Like, I am Mm -hmm. so glad that he has other people to talk about that stuff with. Yeah. And then there's just things I, you know, I don't want to talk about, I don't like to do. Um, I don't have that same sense of humor, um, if he relied on me for all of the humor in his life, his life would be so sad because <laughs> I am like one of the worst joke tellers in the entire world. Like it would, he would be miserable. Um, but I enjoy listening to other people tell jokes with him, right? Because I, <laughs> I have yes. a similar sense of humor, but I can't generate it the same way. Right. Most of his humor at me is laughing at me, not like from a me doing something silly perspective, not my, you know, creativity with, with comedy. Um, and so I agree with you. And and I we moved so much growing up. And we had this joke that my mother started that as soon as the house was decorated and the way my parents wanted it, it meant we were moving again. 
Right. And I didn't think it was a big thing um, to get as a message as a kid, but it really was a big message in the sense of you have this dream, you're going to work to fulfill it. And when the dream is complete, like you, you're then moving on to the next one. Like there's this, the satisfaction of enjoying the completeness is usually very short, um, if if at all. You better enjoy the process of making it. Right, right. Thomas Jefferson, he wrote to his son when he was first going to France, because there was a lot of the French um, American connections at that time. And he writes in this letter on the eve of his leaving, talking about how he's so proud of him for taking the journey to go abroad and experience new cultures. And he goes, but I want you to know that you will never be 100% content ever again. Mm -hmm. The second that you leave your bubble, like your whole universe is here right now. Mm -hmm. And the second you leave that bubble, your life is going to be 10 times more expanded, but you will never feel the peace Mm -hmm. of having your whole world in one place. And it is such a profound statement for me because Mm -hmm. that's what I deal with all the time. Mm -hmm. Like I have friends all over the world. I have family all over the place. Um, I have like my, one of my favorite restaurants is in Nuremberg, which, you know, not the gastronomy (laughs) capital of the world, but it's like, there's just something about that one place and what we experience that I'm like, yes, that place. Um, And I went to a friend's baby shower who is from here, grew up here. And she had, women from her whole life there, her friends from high school, from college, from, you know, being an adult, all of her family. And I drove home, I had a great time. And then I drove home bawling. And I was like, what is wrong with me? And I'm like, oh, I'm mad because I will never get that. Like, even if I had, like, assuming I'm going to get married someday, even at my wedding, everyone will not be there because either people will no longer be with us, (laughs) like, or they just can't come. And so there's like that struggle of, I can't deny the wanderlust and the curiosity and what else is out there. And so it's, it's balancing the acceptance of knowing that I could never stay in one place, even if I tried. And how do you keep moving and keep being curious and be present to the contentment and appreciation for all of that going on? Yes. Yes. I, I struggle with finding that too. And I I completely agree. I've been thinking a lot about, especially today, actually this morning, like a conversation rose and I've been thinking a lot about like what it takes to have what you want and you have to be willing to like play or give something up or Mm -hmm. work hard or, or go out on a limb. It, It requires some action on your part, I think, to have the things that you want. Maybe not maybe only if you're like expanding outside your comfort zone or if you want something bigger than what is like normal. And I don't really know what I mean by that, but I just, I get the sense that there, there are people whose lives, like they're not putting that demand on themselves and that's Mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with that. But when you want something that's a little unconventional maybe, Mm. or something that's not quite like normal or easily um, accessible, easily accessible Mm -hmm. then it requires something extra of you and um my husband and i have been creating this vision for what our life in canada will be like Mm -hmm. and when we share it with people one of the most common responses to various aspects of it is oh that's a lot of work (laughs) i heard it again from someone and i I got really angry this Mm -hmm. morning about it because i was thinking like what isn't a lot of work what worth having isn't a lot of work and if you're not working towards something, it doesn't need to be a financial something. If you're not yeah. working, what are you doing all day? Yeah. And I, this idea of like happiness being its destination that we arrive at, like I derive happiness from the work of moving towards that destination. Yes. And work could mean like discomfort or work could mean hard conversations or work could mm-hmm. mean like actual physical toil and labor. Mm-hmm. But I'm game for all of that. And um, this morning it came up, I was feeling really protective of that vision. And it's hard enough to maintain a vision for an unconventional life yes. anyways, mm-hmm. without like everyone around you uninvitedly sharing that they're like, oh, it's going to be a lot of work. Be careful. Like, thank and, you, but no, thank you. And people don't even realize that they're doing it. They don't. And 
so my husband and I had this conversation. He was like, why are you so upset by this? And I think, you know, I was mentally preparing for our conversation and thinking about the kind of things that I wanted to share. And Mm -hmm. you had sort of prompted me with a few questions. And I was thinking about those like really vulnerable moments in my life where I I declared I wanted something Mm -hmm. and the people I trusted dissuaded me with an offhand comment or yeah. maybe just offered something from their experience that actually changed my path for a little while. And maybe I was I was detoured by years by mm-hmm. that comment or I held a belief for a really long time. You know, someone in my life, I said, I'm going to travel around the world. And they said, you better not have kids then because kids are expensive. And it wasn't until like five years ago in a guided meditation mm-hmm. that I like, I disconnected those things. Mm-hmm. And it I'm passionate about this because I think when we give like offhanded comments without thinking about it, we don't even know what kind of damage we could be causing when someone's being vulnerable and sharing their dream with us. Like we have to be careful with those things. And we don't always realize um, those small moments happen in, in like literally small exchanges of time and substance. And we don't, We are so often not responsible for what comes out of our mouth, even me included. With my sister, right? With my sister sitting next to me, I know that she's been the victim of this many times as we've been growing up together, um, especially as a bossy older sister. um, That there's something about just that golden rule of if you have nothing nice to say, just don't say anything. Like just wish people well and step back. And if you still are stuck on something, like you're you're generally concerned for somebody for some reason, like figure out a way to tell them that without stepping all over what they want to do. Yeah. Like it's and and we don't realize it because um one of the best things I've learned is that any uh concern or criticism always comes from a commitment. And there's always love and support under those things, even if they're very deep. <laughs> you have to get yeah. go through a lot to find what it is that that person's committed to for you. But whenever someone says things like, um, you know, going back to how we started about there's no money in art or there's always suffering in art or you can't have kids if you want to travel. Those are all people who are want to make sure that you are so happy that you don't yes. run into these roadblocks that someone somewhere has run into. But they also don't allow for the opportunity for you to create it completely differently. Yeah, exactly. It's like this singular uh, thought of like, there's one way to do it. And yes. the traveling and kids thing is a personal issue I have because it makes me crazy that it is also because I'm such a travel person. Um, if I could spend all of my time traveling with interspersed with seeing the people I love, I think that's how my whole life would end up. Um, which is why traveling podcasts is what's on the, on the vision board. Um, (laughs) Jordan just put her head in her hands like, oh my Lord, (laughs) (laughs) I'm really not going to have any free time anywhere. (laughs) Um, but so, but it makes me crazy because people travel all the time with families and my parents are an example. Like we didn't, we weren't traveling the world um, for the sake of traveling. We were moving because of my dad's work. Um, and everyone told them like, what are you doing to these kids? And blah, 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 like all these, we're fine. In fact, yeah. we're probably more fine than a lot of kids because you just, one, kids are way smarter than adults. And two, You figure it out. Like, it's fine. This is real life. You can't protect people in a bubble. (laughs) Well, and what? You gained something. You had to lose something to gain something. So Mm -hmm. you lost, like, the childhood home that you never moved out of and maybe the same same group of 10 friends throughout your whole childhood. But you gained resilience and the ability to make new friends easily, Mm -hmm. I'm guessing. Yes. And... I think about that too, because my husband and I have shared our vision with people. I'm like, well, if you have kids, you have to slow down. Why though? I know people like, Mm -hmm. I'm not, that's easy for me to say right here without kids so far. So I get it. Like I will, I'm, I'm aware of the possibility that I could change my mind. Right. Um, but let's just have a conversation about it from a place of what if and why not first, instead of telling me how it has to be from your life experience only or your viewpoint only. Mm Mm-hmm. I just had a, a a client meeting this past week, and we're we're I'm helping them build their dream job, 
And so we're starting from zero, which is my favorite place because it really allows me to lay the foundation of the vision and the dream and your commitments and what you care about as the platform um, to build everything else on, right? Like it's so awesome to start with the clean foundation. And we did all that work and now we're moving into like the next phase of the journey. And instantly the panic for this client set in of, well, what if I don't make enough money and who's going to hire me? And all the things, all the negative what ifs showed up. And I was like, okay, I'm going to ask you to write down all the things you're concerned about on a piece of paper. And if it was me, I'd write them down and throw it away. (laughs) Right. Potentially burn them. Definitely get rid of them. If you don't want to go that far, just write them down, fold them up and like go stick them somewhere. Like go hide them under your underwear drawer or something. Because we're not going to deal with that stuff for such a long time. Like you're still in the phase of creating the dream. Yeah. And, and we'll get there. Right. We like, deal with that today. Right. If there are no negative repercussions, what, what would it look like? How many times a year do you want to do this? How many clients do you want? Um, like talk about all the big stuff because all the things that we stress out about are figure outable. Like how do I find money? So many ways to find money. Um, how do I get clients? There's so many ways. Let me tell you something. Yes, ma'am. There have been multiple times where mm-hmm. I have said to myself, I don't have the money for this and I don't know how it's going to happen. And the, the, somehow the universe gives me the money for mm-hmm. it and it happens. And then yep. the other thing, the most impactful thing that happened to me was from uh, our seminar stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, like one of the exercises were to say everything that you fear to someone and they repeat the same exact thing to you and you realize how crazy you sound <laughs> like to hear someone else say your fears and like thinking that like I know I didn't I didn't mean it that way like no no they're like I'm not good enough I was like no 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 you you're you're great you are good enough and they're like well that's what you just said and I had to repeat it and I was like oh yeah. okay <laughs> this makes a difference what if we talk to ourselves the way we just spoke to our friends? Right. What if, you know, like the, the gremlin in mm-hmm. my head says the most terrible, heinous shit to me. Yes. I would never, ever say anything like that to anyone I love or even a stranger on the street. Yet Mm-mm. how I speak to myself mm-hmm. is just terrible. I'm working on that. <laughs> well, I just think we just need to stop spending so much time listening to ourselves. Like that. Would, yes. Can I offer yes. like a new perspective on this? Please. Because this Elizabeth, Elizabeth Gilbert seminar that I went to, seminar, workshop, I don't know what to call it, in, on Oahu. She, we had like, I don't know, a letter, an exercise where we wrote a letter to ourselves mm-hmm. from the point of fear, enchantment, permission, persistence. Were these uh, all individual? Truth and divinity. Yeah. Truth and Age divinity. Individual. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't want to give away her her work, but yeah. that was the essence of it. Uh-huh. And she said, you know, like, imagine, like, you know, sit down with fear and just for once, listen to it. And I'm not saying you have to take anything it says mm-hmm. on as truth, mm-hmm. but just listen to it and what it has to say. Because fear has a really important job. Yes. Fear, fear is what keeps us alive mm-hmm. in, in some cases. So um, don't listen to it the way you think, like the way you have been, where you're not really listening, yeah. like when you're fighting with someone and you're like, I'm listening, but you're just waiting to say your next point. Oh yeah. After all that happens and after everyone's yelled and cried and you're sitting down at the old Oak table in the kitchen and you finally can listen to each other. What Mm -hmm. does fear say to you then? And I've, I just letting this happen, letting fear speak to me kind of said like, Hey, you know what? I wish you'd listen to me more. I am here to keep you alive. Like I took on that part of what she was saying. Mm -hmm. And I don't appreciate you just, I know you don't like me, but I don't appreciate that you don't listen to me and you don't have to like believe what I say, but I just want to be heard. And I thought, Oh, who doesn't want that? No, I <laughs> who love, doesn't want to be heard. No, I love that message because so often I feel like so many of the dramas that we deal with in life, especially with other people are because people don't feel like they're being heard. Either we don't feel like we're being heard. They don't feel like they're being heard. If everyone leaves a room or conversation feeling heard, there's no emptiness left. There's no bucket that needs to get filled up with something else. Either 
lies or um, cocktails or you name it, right? And so I actually love that because we don't think about whether it's fear or your mother or the boss that you think you hate. Again, it comes back to that behind everything is a commitment. Like even fear, you know, is there because it's committed to your survival. Doesn't mean it's right, but yeah, if you give it its time, how fast does it go away? Yeah. And if you, you we all know that person where you like try to not hear them, they just start talking louder. Yes. You know, they just raise the volume. So better to just go, okay, what is it really you're upset about here, fear? Mm-hmm. Like, what, what, do you, what are you really worried about? I'm worried we're not going to be able to pay the bills. Okay. I hear you. Mm-hmm. I'm worried about that too, but we'll figure out a way. Okay. You know? Yes. And I, it's so funny because in my head, I'm visualizing this conversation as you're sharing it. And I'm imagining how I handle people at work. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm like, in my head, I'm like, okay, fear. Yep. You said that. I'm going to put it on the whiteboard so we can all come back to it later. Because yes. <laughs> that's why like being feel heard and known and seen, yeah. right? So mm-hmm. um, I think there's, I don't want to listen to the terrible things my fear says to me, but I do want to acknowledge its place in my life and in the creative process and, mm-hmm. and the things that fear has, fear has saved me from yeah. falling off the edge of the cliffs right. and from getting into sketchy situations. So like fear right. does deserve some credit. Yes. It's almost like it, it needs a high five or a hug, even when it might be going a little bit um, yeah. obsessive. Yeah. Because it doesn't know. It doesn't have the ability to say, oh, this is a creative endeavor. Mm-hmm. It's just like anything new, this could kill us. So yeah. we better not do it. Mm-hmm. New relationships, new experiences, new ways of thinking. This might kill us because it's new. Fear doesn't like new things. No. There could be more value placed on resilience. I think that the notion mm-hmm. of like jump, you know, and I think Elizabeth Gilbert said this in her podcast, like the idea of jump in the net will catch you. She disagrees with that, as do I. Mm-hmm. Um I think we've talked a lot today about declare things and if you show up, it will become available. But there's a lot of things that I've asked for that I haven't gotten probably for good reason because Mm -hmm. I wasn't meant to or actually the desire that I spoke loud was coming from a place of scarcity or a a looking good, like Mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. There's also things that I failed at, catastrophically failed at. Oh, yeah. And I learned resilience. Mm-hmm. And Brene Brown talks a lot about like those face down moments and how you pick yourself up. And mm-hmm. our job as like parents and leaders is to should be to encourage resilience and let people fail rather than protect them from failure because that's how you learn resilience. And opportunities to experience things that teach you that I think are so valuable. And mm-hmm. I don't know, to add on to what you're saying, I think resilience should be part of that conversation because it's what we need. Yeah, there's there's been many people recently who are in their early 20s who have asked me, like, they're stuck because they don't know what to do. I'm like, just start. Yeah. And they're so hung up on it being the perfect yeah. choice. I remember that feeling from when I was younger. For sure. And I'm like, I don't, your life is going to change, not 360 degrees, but whatever five or seven or 10 revolutions are going to create so just start now because the the fun part is that you're starting the momentum like yeah. you might be in a job for two weeks two months two years 20 we don't know yet like go figure it out I don't know what might be going on for those people particularly but I felt that I have felt that feeling and I still sometimes feel it and mm-hmm. I that experience of like what should I do and what's the right thing and yeah. I've realized that part of that is because there is like a very popular narrative about the way that things are supposed to work and the order in which you're supposed to do them yes. by when you're supposed to do them. Mm-hmm. And so I felt when I was younger, a lot of pressure and I still do now at like, well, this is how old I am. So here's what I should have done and accomplished or mm-hmm. here's or it's too late for that. And one resource that I recently discovered that has completely shaken that up for me was I was like an online community called Ageist. Okay. And um, it's aimed at people. I, I'm, I don't know exactly what they've declared. I think it's aimed at people like 50 and older or something mm-hmm. like that. And it's sharing the stories of 
entrepreneurs, people who have done the same job for 35 years and then the age of 67 decided to go back to school. And it just, it shifted something inside me when I discovered this network of like, oh yeah, there's so much time. There's also simultaneously, there's two truths always. There is no time to waste, but there also yeah. is, is time to figure things out. And the people in my profession who I admire came into their own in their 40s and mm-hmm. in their 50s. Mm-hmm. I, why am I not there yet? Because nobody has ever been there yet at this yeah. point. And the more I start to pay attention to that narrative, mm-hmm. as opposed to this other thing, the more peace I acquire about it all and, and patience. And I mean, I'm really not good at patience, but I'm learning. You are preaching to the choir on that one. Holy <laughs> smokes. Oh my. But yeah. So the people from Aegis, someone wrote me like someone not wrote me personally, but one of, I think, cause I joined the community mm-hmm. at an early stage, they were sending out questionnaires, like what feedback, why are you attracted to this? And I filled it out. And then someone specifically wrote to me, mm-hmm. we noticed your age is not in the age of people that normally are part of this community. Can you share why? Mm-hmm. And I just wrote this like par- <laughs> multi-paragraph. <laughs> email about, like, yeah. I want to, I want I feel like the the things that are available for me to consume in my immediate vicinity are all the success stories, the linear stories, the thing of like, yeah, just do this and this will happen. Mm -hmm. And when you share the stories of real people who in their 60s talk about everything falling apart and building something new from nothing, that encourages me and it makes me realize it shows me other narratives. And I'm so hungry for those other narratives that um, I think they're really important to share. Well, I think if anyone's telling their story fully, those mm-hmm. things will come up. Like yeah. I, I find myself getting a little suspicious when it's like all sunshine and rainbows. I'm like, yeah, what aren't you telling us? Or like what, and maybe nothing uh, externally happened dramatically, but what are the things that you're dealing with? Because being an entrepreneur is not smooth sailing. It is like until recently, I, you know, you look at how people describe it and sure there's tough times and yes, people work crazy hours and you worry about money, but I'm like, no, the thing that surprises me the most is how you can literally go hours or days of feeling like you're a 10 and feeling like you're a negative 10. Like yeah. it is, it is the craziest roller coaster I've ever been on to the point where I'm someone who I think most people would describe as very stable, like I'm, I think that's just how people would describe me as a very stable, logical person. And I find myself in the past couple of months being like, maybe I'm bipolar. (laughs) Like that's, (laughs) that's how much like being an entrepreneur is like ridiculous. Like you, there are literally like manic phases where everything is awesome. You've had all these great conversations. Everything's working. Look at what I got done today. And the next day something happens and you're like, I can't leave the couch. I have to watch all of the movies that make me feel better. I'll start again tomorrow. (laughs) I would say, I mean, not to diminish the challenges of being an entrepreneur because that's Mm -hmm. this whole beast, but I I have noticed, I haven't worn the entrepreneur hat for long time, long extensive periods of time, but I've noticed that come up for me when I start living from a place of like wanting to like self-examination and wanting to see like what's really going on Mm -hmm. and self-reflection and self-actualization. And um, there's a vulnerability in like uh, sharing that, but there's also a vulnerability I find in even being willing to look there to see what actually is. Mm -hmm. And that's another thing that a theme is, you know, funny how these things come up, right? Because as soon as you start thinking about things, you keep finding people who are on the same wavelength or always the same messages come up. But I've been noticing that there's a lot of people who like just want to talk about the positive, you mm-hmm. know, like mm-hmm. what you think is valid. Sometimes people only share the positive, but I remember when I moved to Barcelona, I wanted to share the whole, I've always wanted to share my whole heart with yeah. everyone. Mm-hmm. And people would be like, ah, oh, yeah, it's hard, but like you're living your dream. Like this is what you wanted. And, and I, I want to say all the time, like, yes, that's true. And just because something is wonderful doesn't mean it can't, and what I asked for and what I wanted Mm -hmm. doesn't mean it can't also be excruciatingly painful and lonely sometimes. Like Mm -hmm. things can be, and it can be wonderful and hard. It can be joyful and sorrowful. Yes. But I think we live in a really binary world where things are one or the other and, and life is not like that. Actually, everything is so complex and we oversimplify things to make them 
easier to digest and it doesn't do anyone a service. It's a disservice. No, and it, and it, um, it doesn't give people credit for how complex they are as individuals or Mm -hmm. the universe around them. Like it's, it's, um, it's, it's almost coming from a place of (laughs) hoping it's simpler than it is. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Wouldn't that be nice? Right. Well, before we were talking, I was looking at your beautiful website. Thank you. And I saw all of the very fun projects that you've worked on. I was especially drawn to the um, water safety dress. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Right. I was like, I want one of those. It looks amazing. Um, And I just saw the picture of the woman wearing it. And for people who haven't seen it, it looks like um, she's... There's a picture of a woman in a swimming pool, and it looks like instead of wearing an inner tube, she's wearing like a flower because it's like kind of coming up around her. Mm-hmm. And I was like, and then I just looked at more pictures and saw what it, it was intended to be versus what that picture showed. But in my head, I went, I want to be able to sit in like a flower petal and float. It looks amazing. Yeah. So we might need to create those and sell them on Powerful Ladies because I think that would be a game changer. I'm just imagining everyone now at Coachella floating in flowers. Right? I yeah. mean, that could be something. That could be a powerful image. Yes. And there's so much. <laughs> I mean, we can go down a whole world of like what that symbolism would be as well. But um, good. you've done so much different work and you've done so much work that has gotten um, press and praise and intrigued and inspired people. What does it feel like to be a designer that gets that recognition? Wow. Well, that's very kind of you to say. Thank you. And um, I don't think something I'm working on, because I don't feel any of that of what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> and I need to remind myself, I'm, I'm working on how to feel all of that and acknowledge what has been said and like the credit that mm-hmm. and the validation of the work that I do, how to balance that within myself and how to like confidence and creativity is something I've been really struggling with over the last four years mm-hmm. of like how to be confident without having an ego, how to be more confident. Um, I think it's still a big mess in my head. I don't really know how to articulate it, mm-hmm. but it is a place where I go back to when I need a little boost. Like, Oh yeah, I did. I did speak at MIT about something I made. That's a big deal. You know, when I'm feeling small and low and not necessarily an expert Mm -hmm. on something, I do go back to that. But Elizabeth Gilbert made like, I know other people have brought it up on this podcast. There's a common thread that stitches us all together. But she asked people, creators, like, why do you do this? Like, why do you get up at four in the morning to write? Or why do you Mm -hmm. do all this? And she either said, or people, it revealed herself. And she said it, it revealed it over the course of the podcast and then she summarized at the end like I do it because I have to like and not in the way of obligation but because it's what I like I need to I have to I have to express this Mm -hmm. I think that's um that's something that I have when you know when you notice that it's not for anything external like I just I I need to create it it needs to come out of me Mm -hmm. that's where like some pure expression and living happens I think as well as when you're of service yes yeah. I love those when you're in like the flow state of mm-hmm. like, oh, I just had to make this. Like there's a lot of things on my website that are just questions I ask myself. Like what if our clothing could make us float? And like that is not um, actually a product that exists in the real world, but it came from like, I just mm-hmm. have to I have to ask that question and entertain that thought for a little while. Yeah. Well, and I wish we asked more of those questions as yeah. humanity. Me too. There's fun. Like, Whenever eight-year-old me is happy, then I'm doing the right thing. And there's a lot more fun in yes. that point of view. Yes. I love what you said, too, about, like, slowing down. And um, what I heard for mm-hmm. myself was I have spent a lot of time, because we share this commonality of being, like, achievers and list makers. And mm-hmm. um, I noticed it when you said, like, here are some things that I noticed about your work and the accolade. And I don't really like slow down to appreciate what is happening when it's happening either. Mm-hmm. And I, I should do more of that. I, yeah. I have, I have been more and more, but it takes effort. It doesn't come naturally. Mm-hmm. I had a really surreal experience the other day where my graphic designer was making um, like a one pager press kit to send out. Cause I'm trying to get into other podcasts and do more speaking. And she sent me this thing back and I'm like, 
this girl's a badass. Who is this? And I'm like, oh, that's me. Whoa. When did that happen? And it was like this crazy moment of, wow, huh. I think I like myself. This is interesting. Like it was so weird. Um, And yeah, it lasts for a second and I'm on to the next thing. But it was this crazy moment of, huh, maybe I'm not making this all up. Interesting. Yeah, maybe that little gremlin in my head isn't right all the time. Yeah. I had declared like many, many years ago, I attended Wanderlust in Whistler while I was working at Lulam and we got to go and I was like, this festival is amazing. Mm -hmm. For anyone who doesn't know, yoga festival, music, art, all these things, my favorite things all together. But it's not just the events. It's like the way that things shift in the community at that event that I love and what the teachers say and what comes up in my mind as I'm practicing. It's not about the physicality of yoga at all, like why I go. And then I learned that it was, there was one that took place on Wahoo. I was like, I am going to that one day. Mm-hmm. And, and then I saw that Elizabeth Gilbert was going to be speaking at Waterlust Wahoo. And I was like, this is the one then. I got to go. Mm-hmm. And before I even knew how or, or if, I had book, booked a ticket at least to her speaking event. Mm-hmm. And then I needed to figure out the flight and hotel and all that. I'm not, I'm not usually like that. Um, but I got there and I think if there was this moment we were practicing yoga in an open field, I had already done her workshop and then I was there and I was like laying on my back and it started to rain and the teacher was saying something wonderful and I just felt all the rain drops on my face and then I looked over like Elizabeth Gilbert was on a yoga mat next to me, my <laughs> hero was doing a yoga class with me and I just like, I just took stock of what I had created and mm-hmm. I was literally crying tears yeah. of joy at what I've created. And I, I think that I ought to do that more often because I do create really amazing things and there's no harm in acknowledging it. Um, there's almost like yeah. a, the universe might get pissed off if I don't acknowledge it because it's conspiring to help me yeah. in all of those efforts. Just, just like um, a human, the ego, the universe has an ego. It has humor. It has impatience. It wants you to play along. Like, it's that's really what's going on and I, what an amazing magical moment for you to have yeah like the whole experience the rain the the sense of awareness to have her right there next to you like the to me those are like the movie moments that i love yeah. taking account of i'm like there's no way i could make this up this is amazing right? there's no way i can make this up i love that mm-hmm. i know that there's some luck involved i do believe there's like some luck involved but i also people say to me sometimes like Oh, you're so lucky you got that job in Barcelona. I'm like, was it luck though? Because there was some luck involved, but mm-hmm. I also like worked for years to make a badass portfolio. Yeah. I turned into an internet stalker and harassed every person that worked at that office mm-hmm. in, until someone finally gave me an interview. It's not that I just said like, I want to do this. And then before it happens, like I worry that I've maybe given that impression. There's a lot of hard work that after I declare yes. this is what I want that goes into making it happen and a lot of dissatisfaction and a lot of impatient tears and a lot of like this is never gonna work and oh my god mm-hmm. oh I really just thought I should bring that up because it would be really unfair of me to say <laughs> it didn't I'm, I'm dealing with an impatient like last week I had a bit of a downward emotional spiral because I'm impatient about a certain dream that's just not coming true as fast as I want it to mm-hmm. and you might have to wait longer and work harder. Well, and yeah, there's sometimes things you want, you just, ha- they don't show up always when you want them to. But then also, yeah. they we, never show up when you want them to. Usually in my not, yeah. Um, but sometimes as well, I, be- I also believe that the universe isn't going to give you something that you haven't proven responsibility for. Mm, yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. And I use it often talking about money in the financial course I teach, Mm -hmm. but I think it applies to everything. If you haven't proven that you can, you can do something magical with what you're being given, doesn't mean that you have the pressure to like make magic out of everything you have. But if there's no chance, because you haven't proven it somewhere else before, like you're not going to get those next big things. It's you know, whether you're working on your corporate collateral of what jobs you had, like you said, like how hard you worked cleaning toilets to make one dream of traveling the world happen. Yeah. Like there's a lot of like Jedi ninja mastery that has to go into like doing it over and over and over again and continuing to push. 
because the the curiosity and the manifesting and the dreaming about it, like all of that has to happen, but it doesn't happen in isolation floating <laughs> through through time and space. It happens grounded in the persistence and yeah. like I'm going to do it no matter what. Um, it's It's really... And sometimes it does just magically happen. You're like, I don't know if I deserve that right now, but I'm going to take it. Yeah. And those are, I, I consider those like a free pass you get because you're like, all right, you were, you deserve that from something else you've done. <laughs> but yeah. usually, Maybe karma points or something. Yes. Yeah. I'm going to, like, am I cashing in for this? Okay. I'm going to cash in. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I agree. So um, you've talked about your husband a little bit. Were you guys mm-hmm. married together before you went to Spain? Did you meet there? Uh, no, we met, uh, I think, 11 years ago. Mm-hmm. Actually, funny that I brought up the yacht thing because while I was working on boats, um, this was before I was part of Facebook or mm-hmm. that there was, like, travel blogs um, back in those days, back in my day. <laughs> um, I had a friend. I was, you know, I was traveling around the world and doing cool stuff, and mm-hmm. I was emailing, like, when I had internet, emailing, like, three photos of an entire trip to my mom and spending like 45 minutes in an internet cafe trying to send those three pictures Mm -hmm. and and just like not having the time or patience to do that with more than just a select handful of people and my um my friend reached out to me and he said hey i know you're on this trip a buddy of mine just created a travel website a travel blog so you can put all your trips there and you can put a little link on google earth and you can show your path and and upload photos and you should you should try it out he look, he's looking for beta testers or new members or something like that and well, that sounds cool so i created an account and um what i thought was like an automated computer mm-hmm. message of like hi welcome this is brian um i thought that was just an auto generated message but it was actually him personally <laughs> And apparently what I didn't know, and he hates that I tell this story this way because he's like, you make me sound like an internet stalker. But um, <laughs> May have been true. We'll decide. Yeah. I was just one of the first people to really use his website the mm-hmm. way that he intended. And, and I was doing what he thought were interesting things because he was really passionate about travel and photography. Mm-hmm. There was this person traveling in an interesting way. And so he kind of like got to know me in a one-sided way um, through me using his website. And then which is normal right well that's what everyone does today it's not it's not stalkery sorry brian um (laughs) no he was just ahead of his time in meeting people through the internet and like it's crazy how you there are people who um i haven't met their children like because they're friends of mine and like they we don't live and then i meet them and i'm like i know everything about you and they're like you're weird we've never met i'm like shit i'm one of those people well, it's hard not to, right? With the way things are. Yes. So when when I was traveling, he was like, when's this Dana girl coming back from her trip? And everybody was like, don't call her Dana. She hates that. It's Dana. Don't <laughs> make that mistake, which is true. Uh-huh. I give everyone three strikes um, and then something really bad happens. I don't know what yet. I haven't had to enforce it. Um, but I guess when I did come back from my travels, that mutual friend arranged for us to meet and we've been together ever since. But when I first met him. Hold um, on. Yeah, you just skipped through a whole lot of juicy, good details. You went from like, (laughs) he may have stalked me. I came home. He said my name right. And then we've been together ever since. I'm like, no, 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 no. (laughs) There was an event where I was there and Alan, our mutual friend, was like, you know everybody here, right? I was like, who's that guy? over there? He's like, oh, that's Brian from the website. I was like, oh, it's a real person? Like that was the moment that I realized, Mm -hmm. oh, it's a person that you know. It's not just like this internet a personality that doesn't right. really exist and um unfortunately for him he had like a really really ugly mustache at the moment because oh. of some november thing yeah. or some some weird event that was happening so i was like Ugh, that mustache has got to go but the rest <laughs> of him seems really awesome <laughs> the mustache was gone shortly thereafter and, mm-hmm. and then we went on a few dates i wasn't i wasn't really looking for a relationship at that time which is how it goes right when you're not always looking for something it shows up and fortunately for me, he was really persistent. I was in university and really focused. I was at art school then and like mm-hmm. head down, really focused. And he'd be like, let's hang out. Now I'm busy. I have to do an all-nighter tonight for a project that's due. And then there'd be a knock at my door at 11 o'clock. And like, 
I opened the door with him and he had a little one pot coffee maker. He's like, I noticed you don't have a way of making coffee. How are you going to stay up all night to do this project? And he's just like That's the most kind, generous person that I know. Mm-hmm. And luckily he was persistent and, um, and stuck it through at the beginning when I was a little bit scattered and continues to stick it out these days when I'm a little bit scattered. Well, that's part of the reason why I wanted to hear the story of Brian, because I think when, I think it's important for people to talk about how they can create their best life and follow their personal path Mm -hmm. and what that looks like when you have a partner, because it doesn't, your paths are not always going in the same direction. And so how do you, you know, what, what does it look like for people who don't know to create visions together and goals together and the ebb and flow of maybe one person leading when an, and then another one leading at different phases? That's a great question. I, I love that you asked that because I think sometimes we don't, when we think about like successful relationships, I don't think we give enough credit to like chance in that you need to find someone who happens to be interested in the same things you are at that Mm -hmm. same time and be available emotionally or Mm -hmm. logistically there is an element of chance I believe um I think we're both very strategic people Mm -hmm. so we both like part of why I wanted to be designers because I had to create but I also knew for a love of travel designers get to live internationally there's a lot of travel involved so it was a very strategic choice on my part Mm -hmm. and he's a very strategic person as well and He's a software developer and he knew that for him working as a contractor or consultant for himself was what was going to get him the lifestyle that he needed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he buckled down and spent a few years at the beginning investing time and effort so that later he could work for himself and and struggle through that first few years of difficulty that there is of being an Mm -hmm. entrepreneur Um, it's always a struggle, I suppose, but especially (laughs) uncertain at the beginning. Yeah. So that, cause we had created like organically through conversations, like what if we did this and what if we did that? And Mm -hmm. then, okay, I love that. What would it take for us to be able to do that? Mm -hmm. Like if we want to live in Europe, we wanted to live in another country together. If we want to live in another country, we're going to need a visa. Mm -hmm. That will come down to me because I will get the job somewhere Mm -hmm. because that's more likely than you who works on the internet needing a visa somewhere so okay you work you get your home stuff set up you get your personal business set up and then I'll start hustling for these jobs around the world Mm -hmm. and then that's how we'll go it was very strategic conversations and actions and fortunately I do feel like part of why we're a great team is because we want similar things not Mm -hmm. always but in general like our vision for life is as um on the same not the same path, but on a parallel path. Like we're headed in the same direction, yep. which I think is really important. And and also we're, we have different strengths. We're mm-hmm. very different people. I think that's true for a lot of couples, but yep. I'm, I'm uh, the whimsy. He's the practical. I'm the like, what if? And he's the um, logistical person. Mm-hmm. We actually, like when we go on a trip together, we have roles and responsibilities for creating that trip. Like I dream up something and find out like the coolest place to have a drink and the best area to see the sunset. And he mm-hmm. books the flights and the hotel because he's really good at like analyzing a bunch of options. That's his computer brain and how uh-huh. it works. And so when we dream up something, like what would it look like for us to live in Hawaii for four months? How can mm-hmm. we make that happen? He'll kind of like pass the ball to me. Like what, how would we do that? And then once I say like, well, what if this, this, and this came about, mm-hmm. then could we do it? And then he can put in the the logical or the logistical aspects to bring that to fruition. So we did, we did have this dream of like, what if we lived in Hawaii for four months? And he kind of challenged me like, if you can find a way for it to be rent neutral for us, I'm down. Mm-hmm. And then I went like, all right, challenge accepted. Right. Let me see how we can do that. Yeah. And we ended up finding someone to sublet our place for the exact price of a place that I found on Airbnb in Hawaii for like like one to one. So we just were rent neutral. I mean, life is more expensive in Hawaii, but yeah. like he he's often said to me, like, I admire how you dream stuff up. There's things that I didn't think of or know was possible. And I love mm-hmm. that you challenged me. And I love that he's game for all of that. Cause I think there's a lot of people who would be really uncomfortable with some of the things that I've cooked up. Mm-hmm. But, <laughs> but I love the element of the challenges, right? Cause mm-hmm. I, to me, 
I'm addicted to like 30 day challenges, to playing games, to Mm -hmm. like, I like it when someone tells me it's not possible Yeah, because then I'm like, Oh, it's happening. This is great. Thank you for that message. Um, And I love that because there are one of the, we have the uh, nonprofit as well. And Mm -hmm. in the game with the nonprofit is always how to do it for free, how to Mm -hmm. get the entire event free where no one needs to donate. It's like money. It's all donation based in kind giving. How do we make it happen? And, you know, it's one of those boundaries, you know, kind of coming full circle to how we started the conversation of what people say makes something not possible. Mm -hmm. That's when you instantly can flip it around and be like, okay, what if that doesn't happen? Or if it does, what do we do to mitigate it or Mm -hmm. make it better? And that to me is the creative process of designing your life that is the most fun, the most fun. I love it. Mm -hmm. I think I like that you said designing your life because I was thinking, you know, when I lived in Barcelona and my, I was meeting colleagues and friends and like, what does your husband do? Because for a lot of people I met, their partners were in other countries and they weren't living in the same city. And Mm -hmm. you're so lucky you get to live in the same city as your partner. And I thought, yeah. And it was by design. Like we designed that. Mm -hmm. We're lucky that the design came to fruition, but it's not that we just like fell ass backwards into the situation. There's a lot of like years of intentional work to get to this situation. Yes. When you realize that um, most of life is a game that you just have to find the keys for Mm -hmm. and find the door that the key matches and you can start really crafting whatever you want. That to me is what freedom really looks like. Yeah. And I I always come back to when I was in Germany and meeting like-minded people on paper, we all look the same, but we came from so many different parts of the world. Mm-hmm. And it was during the um, like the whole conversation of like the ninety nine versus one percent on Wall Street because I right. moved there beginning like very beginning of t- two thousand and eight when all when the recession was starting. And I sat there. We were probably in some ridiculous place that makes us sound like total jerks of like you know at a villa in Tuscany or something having a great time on a weekend because you could and I'm sitting there with great people eating great food drinking great wine and we were by no means wealthy we just happened to be in driving distance of this opportunity yeah and um just sitting there and going oh people are talking about money this has nothing to do with money like we are in the 0.001 percent because it's not a money game it's a how do you make what you want to happen no matter what? And how do you say yes to an opportunity that you don't know what's going to look like? And to sit, you know, around a table with a bunch of people who were like-minded in the way of, well, why not? Like whatever came up, why not? Oh, you want to do something that sounds totally insane? Stranger things have happened. We know people who can make it happen. (laughs) Well, I think it's important too to like acknowledge that you and myself and those other like-minded individuals, like we, I, I'm really waking up to like disclosing that like I'm, a, I have some privilege that a lot of people around the world don't, you yeah. know, in terms of like where I grew up and the country I live in and mm-hmm. the healthcare I'm provided and the support network that I have, like none of this happened in a vacuum. Mm-hmm. You know, if I, mm-hmm. if I failed, I had someone who could take care of me. Yeah. When I dropped out of university and went to art school, if it all went sideways, I had shelter, you mm-hmm. know, like, in terms of, I think you've mentioned on another episode, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Like yes. all of this was made possible because almost all of those were met. So mm-hmm. it's not to say that this is available to anyone. Like there are people suffering all over the world. And sure, this sounds really nice. There's just why yes. not? You have to have a lot of different levels of necessity or needs met before mm-hmm. you can start considering living in Europe for yes. four years. So just to like acknowledge that because it's not just in a vacuum all these dreams like we do have some privileges that should be talked about too completely completely and it's funny like as as you're talking about like who can live in europe and i think of just all the refugees who are like we're gonna live in europe and you're like yeah oh well they're gonna do it any way they can so when i think about we have so much privilege and i am so thankful and blessed for everything that I do have and the people that are in my life and the other opportunities. 
And I look at the people who you would say on paper don't have those opportunities. And it further like gives me a kick in the ass to say, mm -hmm. look at what they're doing with none of the points that they yeah. have. Like, if, you know, again, going back to the game analogy, if you're playing Monopoly and you have like an entire street, someone can still win the whole game that has yeah. that's in jail, like has nothing. Yeah. And it's it's such an opportunity to know that, you know, what do you what do you do without and what do you do when you take what should be requirements for success and throw it out the window? Yeah. It's like, is that scary? Is it freeing? I think it really depends on. And We're both. The, yes. And usually at the same time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so we ask everybody on the show where they put themselves on the powerful lady scale. Zero, average everyday human, 10, super powerful lady. How do you feel today? How do you feel on average? I would say last week I felt like a one and today I'm feeling oh, like seven, eight. I'm climbing up. This maybe tipped me closer to 10, this conversation. So thank you for that. You're welcome. That's my favorite reason to have these conversations. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you look at um, people in your life who have been critical in where you're at today in your life? Well, I would say like my immediate network, my family and my friends. I have mm -hmm. amazing, amazing friends who are like family. I kind of count them all when I say family, like that whole network of people. Mm -hmm. um, there, I have people who, you know, when you were talking about your boyfriend and how you can't be one, you can't be everything to one person. Like mm -hmm. I have this amazing network of people who fill up all the parts of my soul and um and hold me up so i'm really grateful to all of those people and mm -hmm. um especially like my my mom and my husband who put up with my crazy wacky dreams <laughs> and my impatient um type a achiever personality mm -hmm. a lot of the time what i know is not easy for them um, because I can be in frustration or impatience a lot of the time because of that, mm -hmm. the, the patience that they show me is an inspiration and like all the, I guess all the like incidental interactions have led me to where I am. So like that jerk of a technician at the wood shop, like I wouldn't be a soft product designer maybe without him being a jerk, you know, uh -huh. I just kind of acknowledge all of those things and and every story I've heard has like shaped me in not every story probably, but a lot of stories of people I've heard of people I know and people I don't know mm -hmm. have shaped me a little bit and given me new perspective. And all of those things are a culmination of like to where I am in this point in time in this world. And I'm grateful for every, each and every single one of those, because I wouldn't be here talking to you right yeah. now without all of that. And what are you creating for 2019? Like what's on your to-do list this year? Um, to-do list. Great question. You know there is one, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, we really want to find a home and buy a home and like build. And it's not about the house. It's about the word home I use really specifically. It's about mm -hmm. the feeling and the lifestyle that we're trying to build. Um, and that's just, you know, I don't get to control how fast that happens. It means looking at a lot of places. And of course I have something really, really specific in mind mm -hmm. and it has to look and feel a certain way. And like, not to say that I'm being picky. Like I, I also want to like renovate something. I want to get my hands dirty. Mm -hmm. I want to build something from nothing or from mm -hmm. a shambled version of some, <laughs> somebody else's, you know, dream to what, I and my husband are dreaming about. So there's that. Um, I have a lot of goals around writing that I've been putting off mm -hmm. for various reasons that are back in the forefront um, in 2019. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of like fun to be had this year and a lot of adventures to go on locally. I'm back in the wonder nature wonderland that I grew up in and there's like whales to see this summer and hikes <laughs> to do and kayak trips and all of those things. So I think maybe this year is like got the fewest but biggest items on the to-do list Yeah, than in recent years. And we started this conversation by Adeline declaring that you're her Canadian Oprah. Oh. Where 
why would she think that for people who don't know how you guys have interacted and where mm-hmm. do those accolades come from? Oh, that's a great question. That probably comes from our conversations and the interactions we had where everyday moments, like through the way that her and I can have a conversation, everyday moments can mm-hmm. be like re-examined from a new point of view. And she plays just as much a role in that dynamic as I do. So mm-hmm. I'm not like the source of it either. But we had such we have such different perspectives. Mm-hmm. And so there's like a riff on her asking a question or presenting like this thing that she was challenged with and me saying, well, look, what about this? I've, through all the various things that I've learned and all the different wise people who've taught me things mm-hmm. and my own experiences, I get to bring that perspective to the table and then it riffs with hers. And, and there's, um, there's like a playful dynamic that is special that maybe is why she's talking about that. Mm-hmm. A culmination of, I should acknowledge for myself, even though like a culmination of, 10 years probably spent in the work of self self um, reflection and mm-hmm. self involvement and actualization, like reading a lot of books, talking mm-hmm. to counselors, attending workshops. Like that is, it's not that just by happenstance, all these things have come to me. I've worked really hard to find them and unearth them. And I like to share them with people who are interested in talking about that kind of stuff. I hear that. Yes. <laughs> um, I think too, when, um, what I got from Adeline share, and I think it's also how, what shows up in her, our relationship, like ours being Adeline's and mine, mm-hmm. when I really believe in the phrase of namaste. Mm-hmm. And if you see the light in someone else and they see mm-hmm. it back in you, it creates space for a whole new richness of relationship dynamic to come up because it gives you the space that if if you think somebody knows you're awesome already that no matter what you share or say isn't going to take that away from you there's this vulnerability on top of a foundation of trust and love that allows the magical moments to happen yeah because so yeah. often the good juicy stuff you don't share right away because you're more concerned about the security of that relationship Mm -hmm. and you know when that's when you don't need to worry about that you know maybe the most important of the hierarchy of needs there's just something there where you really get to contribute to each other in a whole higher plane yeah I agree I agree and I think there's like maybe other hard to name thing circumstances that were at play as well. Like perhaps I know during that time that I met her, that I was struggling with like feeling confident and out of place Mm -hmm. and um, other like, you know, I was different than a lot of people and probably Mm -hmm. for cultural reasons, but probably for, because of what I'm interested in and the, Mm -hmm. the work that I do. And just to find someone who was like, on a similar wavelength allowed that vulnerability to like open up right away. Mm -hmm. And um, had we met in a different circumstance when I wasn't necessarily like as challenged by my life, perhaps I wouldn't have been that well, like it could have gone so many different ways. So, Mm -hmm. but I'm so, so glad that I met her and just like a gift from the universe, Mm -hmm. a balm for my soul. Some days I think that we were that for each other. We felt I think I'm not trying to put words in her mouth, but I think sometimes we felt a little bit lonely in that community in terms of like not Mm -hmm. many people were, at least they weren't sharing it if they were thinking about these kind of things or talking about these kind of things. So there was some solidarity in that that I was really needing. And I also want to point out to everyone listening that with both of you being feeling maybe not powerful, you actually were able to be really powerful for each other. Yeah. Like there's a, a reoccurring myth of, you know, being powerful, being a powerful lady means you have your shit together, you've achieved your goals. It's like what we talked about before about being at the end of the story instead of in it. Yeah. And I think that your power is actually like being in it, being in mm-hmm. it and still doing it anyway. Like that's the power. Yeah. And and to see that you can be in it and dealing with things and provide such a bright light to somebody else while you're in it and talking about it and help each other along the way. Like, I mean, that's, 
that's what's awesome about being human. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. I like that. I haven't thought of it that way. You're welcome. Um, so as we wrap up, what else do you want the audience to know about you? Or what would you like people to be left with if they want to know they don't feel powerful, they're not feeling empowered? What's one thing that they can do or a handful uh, to start now to, you know, go ahead and go after where you've been after, like how to figure out how to travel, how to figure out how to find their path mm-hmm. and to, f- to be excited about it? I would say... Because I can only base this on personal experience, not mm-hmm. necessarily from this like omnipotent point of wisdom. Mm-hmm. Um, but go out and if you don't see the narrative that you want for yourself in your vicinity, go seek it. Like it's out there somewhere, a similar narrative. Mm-hmm. Um, read books. Get outside of like the world, the world that you're used to as well. I had this like really useless professor at university but he had this one nugget that stuck with me and I actually it pains me to even admit that Mm because apart from that he was like completely useless but he's like if you're going to design a chair don't look at other chairs go to the opera walk a different route home from work cook a meal you've never cooked before but don't please don't look at other chairs if you want to make a chair Mm -hmm. because you're only going to be informed by what you already know and so I would say like be hungry for for other points of view and be hungry for other stories. I love listening to The Moth, a podcast yep. about people sharing stories. I love reading memoirs. I love re- listening to the podcast, How I Built This. One like of my you're favorites. feeling stuck in like, how to get from here to there. Like that, I love that podcast because it's everybody who's like a mogul in their world who's like, yeah, there was times when I felt flat on my face and we didn't know how to feed ourselves. Like for me, gathering those other stories of people who seem to have similar goals and and ideas as me and knowing that that's one way it could go, but not the only way really fueled me as opposed to just looking at like the viewpoint that I had from my childhood Mm -hmm. and my immediate family, which is like a beautiful family, but just not like that enriched in terms of all the other ways that life can go. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, be hungry for the other ways of doing things and seek out examples. Just if nothing other than to, bolster your confidence that there are other ways of doing it i think that's great advice and a perfect way to wrap up our first podcast (laughs) um really thank you so much for being a yes based on a random email that you got from a stranger (laughs) awesome so thank you for being one of those people and for being a yes thank you for the invitation and for the opportunity and for your time and the space this has been wonderful I can now see why Adeline referred to Dana as her Canadian Oprah. Her wisdom, personal journey, and self-awareness is a motivating reminder of how much our mindset, our asks, and our focus is so important. I'm left remembering to be courageous in my dreams and the design of my own life. We often get afraid to dream what we really want and to take actions towards what we really want as well because we're worried it won't actually happen. This episode is a great reminder to be brave and dream big and create bigger. Thank you, Dana, for a great conversation and for who you are in the world. To connect, support, and follow Dana, you can follow her on Instagram at Dana underscore Rambler. You can visit her website, danarambler.com. Remember to see our show notes for all correct spellings and all other notes about this episode. If you'd like to support the work that we're doing here at Powerful Ladies, there's a couple of ways you can do that. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, or anywhere you listen to podcasts. Leave a review on any of these platforms. Share the show with all the powerful ladies and gentlemen in your life. Join our Patreon account. Check out the website, thepowerfulladies.com to hear more inspiring stories, get practical tools to be your most powerful, get 15% off your first order in the Powerful Ladies shop, or donate to the Powerful Ladies One Day of Giving campaign. And of course, follow us on Instagram at Powerful Ladies. For show notes and to get the links to the books, podcasts, and people we talk about, go to thepowerfulladies.com. I'd like to thank our producer, composer, and audio engineer, Jordan Duffy. She's one of the first female audio engineers in the podcasting world, if not the first. And she also happens to be the best. We're very lucky to have her. She's a powerful lady in her own right, in addition to taking over the podcasting world. She's a singer-songwriter working on her next album, and she's one of my sisters. 
So it's amazing to be creating this with her and I'm so thankful that she finds time in her crazy busy schedule to make this happen. It's a testament to her belief in what we're creating through Powerful Ladies and I'm honored that she shares my vision. Thank you all so much for listening. We'll be back next week with a brand new episode. I can't wait for you to hear it. Until then, I hope you're taking on being powerful in your life. Go be awesome and up to something you love.